the focus of my work um, the last sort of 15 years has been on the state's response to Indigenous peoples, particularly in the area of criminal justice and social policy. I am a critical commentator, so which you'll get to hear in a minute. Um, particular interest within that very broad subject area is restorative justice at the moment. Uh, and the activities of both the policy industry, in other words, the state policy shops, uh, in designing and implementing RJ, and the restorative justice industry as well. Okay. And I also do quite a bit of work around youth slash ethnic gangs um, in my spare time. I'm not a practitioner per se, so you're going to get a sort of a slightly different perspective, I guess, than most uh, that you've heard in the last two days. Okay, but I do work with practitioners quite often uh, in terms of around program design and, and advocating for their policy issues that they have from time to time with government. Uh, the word uh, restorative justice industry, I've just started writing a few papers and I use that term and it's purposely provocative. Okay. Because I use the term industry as the other critical criminologists like Nils Christie and, and, and others who talk about this industrial, you know, crim the penal industrial complex and I talk about the RJ industry okay, in terms of the nexus between the interrelationships that's been growing over the last decade between the policy industry, the state, and restorative justice um, practitioners and people that uh, they own that they've been owning these, uh, developing these franchises and designing these products, a bit like an con industri industrial conveyor belt, that are now being sort of marketed in this thing called a penal industrial complex around the world. And I'm going to talk about that in partic that particular issue and its impact on First Nations at the end. Uh, of my talk. I just thought I'd, I'd very briefly run through the next couple of, uh, of overheads as a way of sort of centering myself in terms of the issues that I'm gonna that I'm gonna be putting forward. I want to talk about this thing with the, poli the political economy of restorative justice in First Nations um, and this is wedded to a lot of my PhD work in which I'm focusing on um, there's almost that the, the period in which I think the, the early to late 70s and when I talk about First Nations, I have to say I'm, going, I'm talking specifically about Māori. But every now and then I will probably make some comment, um, some of it uninformed, about other First Nations that reside, for example, in what we call the Big Three, the outer side of New Zealand, which is Australia, Canada and, and New Zealand, where First Nations reside. So when I say First Nations, I'm generally talking about Māori. Um, the rise of communitarian restorative justice. Restorative justice really is a movement, uh, is, is an idea fell out of this whole communitarian popular justice um, movement that really started to take, to, um, to gain momentum in the 70s. Um, I don't want to, we can debate about, yes, it sort of started probably 34 years later, but as an actual body of theory practice, it started taking form in the 70s as a viable policy approach. Um, one that challenged what, uh, what was at, at, at that time occurring in most Western jurisdictions is very much uh, not a return to but an enforcement of much more punitive uh, policy um, direction. Um, the interesting thing, and this is why it's of interest to me in particular, is at the same time as this was occurring in terms of a theoretical paradigm, if you like, as a policy and practice approach in Western jurisdictions where First Nations reside, we had the radicalisation of First Nation politics. Uh, in New Zealand, but not only in New Zealand, of course, you had the similar process occurring in Hawaii and uh, in Canada and, and, and the United States as well. Uh, so in the late, in the early uh, to the mid 70s, we had the rise of young radical Māori um, protest groups and political groups. Up until that time in our history, our uh, ad, you know hadn't been we hadn't been silent in terms of challenging the state and the way in which it was actually affecting our people. But we had generally, uh, the strategies we'd utilised had generally been quite muted, you know, not in the public eye. We generally would make petition to the Queen or the King uh, of England or to Parliament, or we were corralled our issues, whether they be land or justice or otherwise, or corralled through the formal European justice system. And what we had in the, about the same time as the communitarian justice um, uh, approach was developing, was a real radicalisation. So in other words, we were 
we, we, we got in the face of the state. We started actually challenging its hegemony. Um, we started challenging the legitimacy of its policy-making um, machine. And in one of the main, and one of the main concerns uh, we had with policy errors was its criminal justice policy and practices and its impact it was having on our people. Because at the same time as this radicalisation occurred, uh, there was a significant rise in Māori contact with the crim formal criminal justice system. Uh, it was around about, I think, prior to 1960, you'd have been lucky if the Māori um, representation, for example, in, in the penal system would have been, you know, 15% or something like that. By the mid 80s, by the early 80s, it had gotten up to 50% for both men and women and has pretty much stayed static since then. Uh, we are 15% of the uh, New Zealand population at the last census, about half a million of us. We have a population of four, I think, or just over four million. Um, so, and the focus, of course, of the Māori radical movement was on the, you know, institutional bias, racism, in terms of not only the pol development of policy, but policing practice, correctional practice, and what have you. Okay. And um, so we have the development of communitarian, restorative justice, theory, um, uh, products, if you like, interventions. And then in the, in the late 80s, there's a guy who's, uh, it was actually Moana Jackson, um, in 1988 published a book, Te uh, Whaipanga Ho, which is just Māori and the criminal justice system, a new way. It was based on three years research that he did around New Zealand. It involved uh, hui meetings with about, um, or focus groups for those methodologists, with about 5,000 Māori around the country. And it was published in 1988. And it was, um, to date, it's the only, it was the first and only uh, extensive research into Māori uh, experiences and attitudes of, towards the criminal justice system that's ever been undertaken. It was part, it was, um, he was contracted to do it by the then Department of Justice, which is now the Ministry of Justice, and he published it in 1988. Uh, at the same time he was doing his work, there was another piece of work going on, I think which was finished around 80, 1987, called Puata Atatū. I think I got that right, which was a review of child care protection practices in New Zealand that was undertaken by a man called John Rangiho, who was a relation of mine. Uh, so there was an overlap there between, if you think of the criminal justice system or the control system, including not only the formal components of criminal justice, corrections and policing, but also the way in which our families are policed by social agencies. Okay. Um, and in the both pieces of work, but particularly in Jackson's work, we had, for the first time I think, in, in a form that uh, non Māori could understand, uh, was a description of the processes, okay, the philosophies, the values and the practices that underpin Māori approaches to social harm in both pieces of work. Um, in 1989, for those of you who are all restorative justice people, aren't you? John Braithwaite, um, the uh, professor of law and criminologist at ANU in Canberra, wrote his famous book about reintegrative shaming, in which he invented this whole idea of reintegrative shaming and, and conferencing and what have you. Um, I'll tell you on the side, actually, a little story. Uh, I had the privilege in 1993 of going to ANU and spending the summer on a summer scholarship. And I was given, uh, John was, uh, I was given John as my um, supervisor. In the first meeting we had had, uh, we started talking about his book. And he actually said to me, he goes, oh, I feel really embarrassed because in 89 I put out this book and uh, my ego took a massive boost and I had all these people telling me this is an amazing uh, theoretical approach and it's so innovative. Because of course in the book, those of you who read it, he talks about Japan as the type of low crime society, the communitarian approach they take, wonderful, and the way they deal with it. And he goes, and then he finds that 2,000 miles away, these people had been doing it for about, you know, 5,000 years. <laughs> and uh, he learnt, he told me he learnt a lot about a Eurocentric viewpoint, looking out. And I told him I forgave him, so. <laughs> now, in the description of, of our processes, and when you read John Braithwaite's work, those seminal works in the 80s that set, set the theoretical foundations for 
for RJ as it is today, because uh, then we had our friend Howard Zia come along and all the rest of the others in the early 90s. Um, you can, if you look at it on, uh, just simply in the written word, the surface level similarities between RJ and indigenous Māori approaches. But I would argue that they are surface. Okay, and, and I think it's a very, and I think a very powerful point from what I'm going to talk about later on. Okay, and what fell out of anyway, just to finish off this slide around Jackson's work, and that there were, that actually was quite influential. Not his work; his work had 40 plus recommendations in it, which covered everything from talking about um, uh, not only how we do things, but what we wanted. We didn't want prisons; we wanted habilitation centres. Uh, We'd call them something different, but where we actually didn't divert, but we placed our high need offenders into in community centres for where they could they had maintain contact with their with their whanau, their extended families, the communities, Māori providers and what have you, blah blah blah. And or a whole raft and range of quite innovative well not innovative to us, innovative to Pākehā, to European policymakers, ideas about how we could actually deal more effectively with social harm in this sort of more punitive penal industry that we had. But the only recommendation that anyone heard was a parallel, and they said, well, the other idea is a parallel system, because your one sucks. I mean, basically, it's sucking our young people in, you're, you're over-policing us, you're over-imprisoning us, and prison is not a rehabilitative uh, place, okay, they're coming out worse, and so give us, let us do it ourselves. And so um, the Minister of Justice uh, refused to publish the report, it got published by us anyway. Uh, and it just became a very big doorstop in the report. But it did have some impact, particularly the John Rangiho's um, a review of care and protection um, practice. And so we developed in 1989 the Child, um, Youth and uh, Families Act 1989, which introduced to the world the wonderful family group conferencing process, which is almost like the gold standard, you know, into restorative justice intervention. Any questions so far? Got a couple of Kiwis in here. Want to want to maybe contest that that will view? Huh? <laughs> Be my guest. All right. Family group conferencing is appropriation. Okay. It has been described in almost all the literature. Now I use Māori centred as, and, I, and I'm being um, kind. I've actually read work. Generally, actually, people from this jurisdiction. Australia and Canada and, and, and Great Britain that actually talk about it as a Māori process. You know, this is a process that's based on this old um, culture and, and it's this communal way of actually coming together and dealing with social harm, you know, uh, or it's a Māori-centred one. Most, most uh, commentators in New Zealand uh, that write in this area are not Māori, uh, published extensively, um, Gabriel Maxwell and one or two others. Um, Judge McElray, okay, so if any of you have an interest in this area in the conferencing, you would have read their work or heard them cited. Alison Morris, not a Kiwi, but uh, the ones that have written mostly in the 90s, they started uh, to comment on FGCs at that time, and they generally now are only brave enough to talk about it as Māori inspired or centred, okay. Um, yes, it appropriated um, the design of it, appropriated or utilised certain elements that you can recognise as being Māori in some ways. Okay, having more the family there, uh, giving voice to the victim and offender, etc, etc. Alright, uh, and these are processes that were highlighted in Jackson's work and also in John Rangiho's. Okay, um, the reason I'm making this point is that I do get really hoha, I mean, that means annoyed in Māori. Uh, when the exaggeration of the process has been Māori. And I think that, that it goes through to extend, extends through to it being appropriate for Māori. In certain contexts it is, in my experience of about you know, 50 or so of FGCs that I've gone as an advocate to on behalf of my kids and my family, I have a very big family and they're very naughty. Uh, it's, very rarely, it's very rarely an empowering process. The reason I'm saying that is most of you probably are Kiwis, you probably read only the second or third hand commenta commentators talking about it and who they're citing have a, have a stake in selling this product internationally. Okay, so 
the process, in fact, was never a really interesting thing. It's, it's actually held up by a lot of RJ industry players as almost like a gold standard restorative justice process. It was never intended to be that. There were elements of the restorative elements that were there, it may be fair enough to say that they were, they were appropriated Māori or a reconfiguration of Māori approach. Okay? But it was never actually intended to be restorative <coughs> at all. Um, you know, yeah. Can you describe what you mean by restorative in this case, that it's never intended to be restorative? Like, what are the... Oh, that's fair. That's a fair question. Okay. And uh, if we think about a restorative process as one that is community-centred. Okay, I'll, I'll speak from a Māori perspective if I can. Yeah. So maybe restorative is not quite the right word. A transformative, empowering process was one where you do bring the community of concern together, the victim and offender and all their, their families. And it's one that the community sits down and sets the, the kaupapa for the, the practice. Okay, that would be, a, to me, is a restorative and transformative. Right? Well, this is the state-centred approach where those types of values have been reconfigured to empower the state professionals that run it, okay, for example. So I can't see that being a restorative a restorative justice process, within my view. So you're saying the process was never intended to be, it was never intended by the criminal justice system to be restorative? That, well, there were restorative elements to it, but I guess what I'm saying is the argument that it is a restorative justice pro program well, it depends on your definition of restorative, but it doesn't fit mine. You know, you can say that there are restorative elements, but it is a state sense of punitive. To my mind, I'd argue it's a punitive process. The FGC process says it's running its own. It is, I'll, t I'll maybe talk about a little bit more about why that is in my experiences of it, but it is very much a state centred control process. Okay. Um, it was very much at that time, you know, David Garland, uh, uh, British criminologist who, who, who wrote in the early 90s about this whole rise of responsabilisation, particularly within the youth year, youth and, and family policy. Uh, we, you know, one of the key things we want, we want to hold them, make them responsible and hold them accountable. And that's really much where the principles, the key principles that underline FGC, rather than seeking restora community restoration. Although I'm not sure what it is that you're restoring some of our kids to, given the communities that they live in. There's no point, okay, again, another thing, a restorative process to me, I, I actually hate the word rest restoration, by the way. I actually quite like some of the, the thinking that's going on now around about transformative justice. You can, you, if you focus on the, the other reasons why, from an Indigenous perspective, or Māori one, why it's not restorative, is it only looks at, it's to that particular incident that's occurred perhaps between two individuals, sometimes more, but, you know, uh, and you're looking at vaguely at the, the wider context of that. But if you don't actually go in to actually have a look at the wider social context within which this offending and social harm is taking place and put in plans and ways of actually changing the ground in that community, then what are you restoring these people to? You know, okay, they're not going to be mad with each other anymore, so they're not going to go outside and, you know, have a punch out. But you're taking them back to a context which is an, almost inevitably going to ensure that either they or their siblings or wherever are going to go through the same issues. Mm 